Good morning, everybody. This is John from, from Louisville filling in for Joe. I have a confession to make. I've had a secret relationship with this woman for 43 years. Uh, all the images that you, you're seeing on the screen now are uh, artist renderings of Mary of Magdala. And uh, if you don't know, uh, Magdala is a little fish fishing village on the west coast of the Sea of Galilee, a little south of Capernaum, north of Tiberias. Uh, but, the, but the word Magdala also means uh, a strong tower, uh, which Mary Magdalene certainly was. So most of these images um, reside in my little upstairs meditation room that I refer to as the Magdalene Zendo. And when I'm in the Zendo, I am surrounded. I'm surrounded by the light of nine candles, the sound of water trickling over river stones, wind chimes and bird song, the smell of Japanese sandalwood incense, the taste of spikenard anointing oil on my lips, the feel of an ancient set of prayer beads. And I'm surrounded by all this feminine in energy of all these images that bring me absolute peace and presence. When I am there, it's like being in a sacred space of encounter with the wholeness of the divine mystery. And if I were to boil it down to one word, I would say it's like tranquility. The feeling of being at home in the embrace of someone you love. So today, I want to try to explain how this relationship came to be. I'm going to go ahead and stop the uh, screen share now. Okay. So first of all, I, I want to give a, a public service announcement. Uh, <clears throat> be careful what you say around Jill. Um, a, a couple of months ago, I made a, a comment on Heart to Heart about Mary Magdalene, Mary Magdalene, and um, it was just a, oh, by the way, comment. And then uh, two weeks ago, I get a text from Jill saying, would you mind sharing your, uh, uh, your relationship with Mary Magdalene at, on a heart to heart coming up? And my first reaction was, hell no. <laughs> I don't want to do that. Um, you know, to be honest, um, in order to really understand my relationship with Mary Magdalene, I have to tell you my conversion story, warts and all. And if you've ever done this before, you know how intimidating it, it can be to be so vulnerable and emotional. Uh, <clears throat> but after thinking about it, um, the heart-to-heart -heart community is different. Um, it's a safe space here, uh, a no-judgment zone. And then uh, this morning, I was looking through some stuff, and I ran across this from another Mary, uh, Mary Oliver, that it sums up perfectly the way I feel right now. <clears throat> you don't want to hear the story of my life. And anyway, I don't want to tell it. I want to just listen to the enormous waterfalls of the sun, 
And anyway, it's the same old story. Somebody just trying one way or the other to survive. Mostly, I just want to be kind. But uh, in order for me to really help you understand what, what my relationship with Mary Magdalene is, is like and why I have a relationship with her to begin with, I have to tell you my conversion story. So here we go. Um, <clears throat> I was raised in the Southern Baptist uh, tradition. My grandparents were founders of a Southern Baptist Church uh, in South Louisville. And my uncle was a Baptist missionary in Japan. But my mother was really my first uh, spiritual guide, uh, encouraging me and enticing me and cajoling me to go to church every week. Uh, but something happened uh, shortly after I started elementary school. I was like six or seven years old. And something happened then that changed my mother's life and also changed my life. She had some sort of business to take care of at uh, the courthouse in downtown Louisville. And coming out of the courthouse, <clears throat> coming down the steps, she fell and uh, hit her head and was taken to the hospital. And uh, they diagnosed her with uh, <clears throat> an aggressive uh, form of diabetes. Uh, and then because she had she hit her head pretty hard, uh, the doctors felt that she had some, some sort of a balance disorder. And they never did determine whether or not it was a physical thing or a psychological thing. But from that moment forward, <clears throat> my mother was unable uh, and absolutely terrified to walk anywhere uh, in an open space. She was okay on an interior space. If there was a wall nearby or a piece of furniture, she could navigate around. But you know, she told me, she literally told me this, that if she saw me in the backyard getting attacked by a pack of wild dogs, there was nothing she could do about it. She, could, she couldn't make it from the house to the backyard without holding on to something. And so my job as a youngster was to go everywhere my mother went, because even if she tried to navigate across, say, a big room, if it was a big open space, she couldn't do it. Uh, <clears throat> she would take one step, and if she was far enough away that she couldn't grab onto something, she would just collapse uh, and pass out. Uh, so. My job was to be her crutch and get her from, you know, uh, she couldn't drive either because of that. So we had to take taxi cabs everywhere we went when my dad was working somewhere. So my job was to get her from the house to the car and from the car to the shopping or whatever she was doing and back to the house. And then once we got to the house, because of this, aggressive diabetes she had. <clears throat> um, uh, my second job was to keep an eye on her because she would frequently slip into a diabetic coma. And uh, when, when I recognized that, I had to run and get orange juice to force feed her orange juice to bring her back. And that would happen at least once a month sometimes more like uh, once a week. So um, <clears throat> I'm sure you're all thinking, uh, oh, what a sweet boy he must have been. Well, not so fast. Um, <clears throat> outside my mother's sphere of influence, I was a rebellious, 
uncontrollable wild child. Um, <clears throat> in grade school, I was the kid with the loudest voice and uh, <clears throat> the class clown, um, often earning straight U's in conduct on my report card. And U is not for unique or unusually great. It's for unsatisfactory. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and frequently, I would even defenestrate myself out of first floor window and walk home in the middle of the day just because I didn't want to stay at school. Um, church, I found to be exceedingly boring. Uh, but at my mother's insistence, I agreed to be baptized at the age of 12. Uh, and then two years, two years later, when I determined that I was, I was old enough to make my own decisions, I walked away from the church <clears throat> and didn't look back. For the next 20 years, um, my shadow did not darken the door of any church anywhere. Um, <clears throat> and my mom graduated into the heavenly realm uh, at age 39 uh, before I could even finish high school. So during those two, two decades, I was 100% focused on first half of the life, first half of life stuff. And my first priority was having fun. Uh, in junior high, which I guess is what they call middle school these days, uh, I discovered I had some musical ability and I taught myself to play saxophone and guitar and joined a, a, a 60s rock and roll band and we became pretty popular and um, <clears throat> we got on the college circuit and were, uh, we were playing at fraternity houses and sorority houses uh, all over Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky, and Tennessee. Um, a lot of fun, especially since uh, half of our band, there were 10 people in the band and half the band wasn't even old enough to drive. So we were swimming in the deep end of the fun pool uh, with uh, the college folks uh, way, way too early. So I was getting into way over my head in the trouble department. Um, and um, I was totally neglecting the second priority in the first half of life is getting an education. So uh, life was one big party, but my grades in high school were really suffering. Uh, in my junior year, um, I was called into the principal's office, which was not unusual. And uh, he said, the, I got to the principal's office and he said, the, the guidance counselor wants to, wants to talk to you. Okay. I thought maybe I'd done something wrong, uh, which was usually the case. But uh, this time he, uh, he wanted to talk and I, I don't even remember this guy's name. And I don't know if he was a genius or a dunce. But he sat me down and told me, basically, your grades are terrible. Uh, I had like a D plus average. Uh, and I was not college material. That it'd be a waste of money for me to go to college. And I should go find a trade. Go to trade school. Do something. Earn your living that way. Well, for me... That was a big FU moment. I wasn't gonna let anybody sit behind a desk and tell me what to do with my life. And it really pissed me off. So <clears throat> again, I don't know if he did this on purpose or not, but the result was is that I really 
buckled down and I, I had a an interest in physics and chemistry and mathematics, but I had never really done anything about it. Uh, but I really buckled down in, the, in my senior year and fast forward a few years. Um, I graduated with a degree in chemical engineering. Um, and uh, I had three job offers from very prestigious companies uh, across the country. And I was accepted into a graduate program at MIT. So uh, problem was that this was also the very height of the Vietnam War. And Congress had just passed uh, something called the draft lottery. I don't know if you y'all remember that or not, but uh, it was one year they <clears throat> they put all the, all 365 days of the year in a hat and they drew them out one by one. And depending on what your birthday was, depending on was your where you stood in the in the lottery system. And my birthday, June 28th, uh, turned out to be number 22 out of 365. So it was almost a sure thing that I was going to have to be drafted. But I was in college, I was running around with the, the, the anti-war crowd. Or really, it, was, it wasn't an anti-war crowd. It was an anti-getting-my-ass-shot-off crowd. Uh, <laughs> so... I, I did not want to go to Vietnam, uh, but luckily the the military was also looking for people that were college graduates for different reasons. So I figured, what the heck, I'll give it a, a shot. I'll go see the different branches of military and see what they had to say. So I went to see the army first, <clears throat> which was a mistake probably. I could have skipped that one. Because it, he, uh, I sat down with a guy from the army and he said, well, I see you're a chemical engineer. Uh, we can put you on a fast track to be a commander of a, a squadron of flamethrowers in the jungle. And I'm thinking, well, yeah, no, I don't think so. Thank you very much. <laughs> so I passed on the army. Uh, then I went to the Navy, and the Navy said, uh, you know, with my education, they uh, they wanted to make me train me as an engineer on a on a nuclear submarine, which was sort of interesting, but being underwater for long periods of time in a cramped space wasn't exactly ideal. So lastly, uh, there was the Air Force, and it, it was kind of like a Goldilocks moment, okay? Uh, the Army was way too hot, the flamethrower. The Navy was way too wet, <laughs> being underwater. The Air Force was just right. They needed, they, they had a, uh, they were desperate for pilots and navigators. Um, so the, the Air Force guy uh, said, we'll give you a direct commission, um, and you can pick any base you want to fly out of, any airplane you want to fly. Uh, my eyes weren't good enough to be a pilot, <clears throat> uh, so they, they sent me to navigator school. Uh, to learn uh, navigation on an air refueling tanker to support the U.S. Air Force in Europe. So no Vietnam. So now, uh, <clears throat> I, you know, I was able to match up an Air Force base that was close to one of the companies I had job offers from. So I had the best, best of both worlds. I had my dream dream job. I dodged the bullet on the war, literally. Uh, I'd started a loving, lovely little family. 
you know, with one daughter and another one on the way. So at age 24, by most standards, I should have been very happy and content, but I wasn't. Something was missing. And it took me 10 years to figure out what it was. Over the next decade, it, uh, it was a blur of commitment and competition and constant pressure to succeed. My travel schedule was brutal. Uh, for my work, uh, I was traveling two to three weeks out of every month all over, all, all over North America. And then one weekend a month, uh, <clears throat> Was, was with the military in, in order to keep up our uh, flight proficiency, we had to take long trips. So we'd take weekend trips to Hawaii, Alaska, Iceland, England, Puerto Rico, South America, uh, just for the weekend. So, so we could get in the hours we needed to uh, stay proficient. Uh, and then three, three weeks a year, I would deploy to Europe uh, to support the U.S. Air Force over there. So it was crazy. And all this time, there was, a, there was an emptiness and a spiritual longing in my heart that I tried to fill with all the wrong stuff. I was rapidly spiraling down a rabbit hole of temptation and addiction. Uh, I became an alcoholic and a workaholic, just to name a couple. Now I recognize this as the dark night of the soul. Um, and I discovered that I was disconnected completely from the source of my being. So 10 years later, at a point of desperation, I was alone in a hotel room somewhere in Northern Michigan. And I reached over and picked up a Gideon Bible off the nightstand and opened it completely at random. And this is what I read. One of the Pharisees invited Jesus to a meal. When he arrived at the Pharisee's house and took his place at table, a woman came in who had a bad reputation in town. She, she had heard he was dying, dining with the Pharisee and had brought with her an alabaster jar of ointment. She waited behind him at his feet, weeping, and her tears fell on his feet. And she wiped them away with her hair. Then she covered his feet with kisses and anointed them with the ointment. Then he turned to the woman. Simon, he said, you see this woman? I came into your house and you poured no water over my feet, but she has poured out her tears over my feet and wiped them away with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she has been covering my feet with kisses ever since I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. For this reason, I tell you that her sins, her many sins, must have been forgiven her, for she would not have shown such great love. It is the, it is the one who is forgiven little who shows little love. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Those who were, <clears throat> were with him at table began to say to themselves, who is this man that he even forgives sins? 
But he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now, I'm going to digress for just a, a minute here. Um, there's a, a bit of a controversy over this passage in, in Luke because it doesn't specifically say that this is Mary Magdalene. Uh, a lot of people assume it is. Um, and <clears throat> the very next paragraph in uh, the Gospel of Luke does mention Mary Magdalene. But uh, it doesn't specifically say that who that's who it is. But for me, it doesn't matter. Um, I imagine a thread, a thread of feminine energy from the chronologically first anointing in Luke, the one I just read, to the second anointing at Bethany, to Mary Magdalene at the foot of the cross, to Mary Magdalene being there when they bring Jesus down off the cross, to Mary Magdalene at the tomb, at the resurrection that circles back to the disciples when Jesus sends her to uh, let them know that he was risen. So Mary Magdalene was not, was not a disciple of Christ, but she was the first apostle. And the word apostle means to be sent. And so she was the first person that G Jesus sent uh, back to the disciples to close the loop. So um, after this, I... I went home and told my wife what had happened, much to her shock and surprise. And she had been raised an Anglican. So in the summer of 1980, we, uh, we walked through the doors of St. Luke's Episcopal Church here in Louisville. And to say the least, it was a very steep learning curve for me. But I felt called to follow the path and determined to give the same level of intensity to this uh, as I did to my education and career. And eventually, the veils started to drop one by one, and old addictions dissolved. Uh, for example, I, I gave up smoking and drinking cold turkey on the same day. Um, and it, it was done. So my mother uh, led me to the practice of compassion, but Mary Magdalene led me to the love of Christ, the source of all compassion. So what does Mary Magdalene mean to me? She's my Anamkara, my soulmate, in a deeply entangled wholeness. Mary Magdalene, Mary Magdalene is my strong tower, a refuge from the craziness of the world. Mary Magdalene is a threshold into the mystery of the divine feminine. where emptiness is transfigured into fullness. Mary Magdalene is a catalyst of transformation of the sacred heart, love transformed into compassion, wisdom transformed into understanding, awareness transformed into awakening. A couple of weeks ago, uh, on Heart to Heart, Joe was talking about uh, uh, the Gospel of St. Thomas, the uh, Logion 114, where 
uh, Simon Peter says to Jesus, uh, let Mary leave us for women are not worthy of life. Jesus said, I myself shall lead her in order to make her male so that she too may become a living spirit resembling you males. For every woman who will make herself male will enter the kingdom of heaven. It, it kind of sounds like that Jesus is saying you have to be male to enter the kingdom of heaven. But you have to take that in context with uh, Logion 22, which says, when you make the two become one, and the inside like the outside, and if you make the male and female one, so that the male is no longer male and the female is no longer female, then you will enter the kingdom of heaven. The truth is, we need to drop the idea of dualistic gender. We are one spirit. And as Joe says, I think there's a sign right behind you, Joe, that says, not two. And uh, to echo that, there's a, 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 a short passage from the Tao Te Ching that, that resonates with that perfectly. This is from the Tao. In the beginning was the one. From the one came the two. From the two came all manifest things. To return to the one, let go of the two. It seems to me that the Western church has lost its connection with the divine feminine and with nature itself. Without these elements of both masculine and feminine, we cannot become fully integrated human beings. We're on a mapless journey and we need a guide to show us the way to be the truth and embody the life. Who is your Anamkara? your soul friend that is guiding you right now. Do you have one? Do you need one? You guys, don't be afraid to embrace your feminine energy and be more sensitive and creative. And ladies, you need to be in touch with your masculine energy as well. And in some situations, you need to be more in control and more forceful. In order to discover true peace and happiness, we all need to find our own particular balance of the secular and sacred, the feminine and masculine. We are one, one spirit, one mystery, one reality. And I want to end with, uh, these are the, the words I use at the, at the beginning of my daily meditation each morning. It goes like this, Mary, lover of God, goddess of light, blessed are your ways of love, wisdom, and awareness. You are the universe reflecting on itself, the synthesis of spirit and matter, feminine and masculine, heaven and earth, one non-dual reality. <laughs>